So you guys have seen a seed before, but if you ever cut one in half, you kind of might see something like this. So to me, this looks kind of like a lima bean, if you've ever eaten that before. And on the outside, you have this tough seed coat, and that protects the seed from rain, from wind, from everything else. Um, and then the inside, you have this called this cotyledon, and that provides a lot of the food for the seed when it first starts to emerge. And what's going to emerge first is this root, or its technical term is a radical, but a little root will come out. And finally, this shoot will come out. And we can see that here in a video. So this is obviously very fast forwarded. But you can see first this root comes out. And I think it looks kind of creepy. It's wiggling around because it's trying to figure out which way is down. And once it finds itself, then the seed coat will release back, allowing this green part to come out. And that will actually push the seed a little bit further up towards the surface. And then you can see the green leafy part, this is called the shoot, will open up and unfurl. And that way, as soon as it reaches the surface, it's all ready to go. And it has its leaves out. It can start making food for itself. The first thing you saw was were roots. The main purpose is to absorb water. But they also help to absorb other minerals, like nitrogen, phosphate, anything like that. So if you guys take vitamins, this is a way that the plant gets vitamins from the soil. Uh, they also help to anchor the plant if there's a lot of wind or if anything else happens. They can also store nutrients. So did you guys know that a carrot is a root? Yes. Yeah. They've measured roots up to 170 feet deep into the soil. This is an example, like I was saying, that plants need different minerals and vitamins to grow. And just like you, where if you don't get enough vitamins, you don't eat healthy food, you don't grow as well. Plants, if they don't get the nutrients they need, their roots will start looking silly because they need to try to go out and get as many of the nutrients they can. So if it has enough of its nutrients, they grow these nice, pretty long, uh, long roots. But if you're low on this is phosphate, or nitrogen or sulfur, then you start to see the roots trying to spread out and get the nutrients that they need. And this is an example. We don't really think of roots being underneath the ground, but a lot of times trees or other big uh, plants will have their roots above ground to help keep them stable. Bacteria and fungi are a big part about how plants grow. And normally we don't think about them unless we're th talking about getting sick, right? You know, if like mushrooms, exactly, mushrooms. And a lot of times you find mushrooms right around trees or they're eating the dead stuff of old plants. So mushrooms and fungi like to live together to try to help each other. Bacteria and fungi that are good can help the plant. So microbes will help them break down nutrients. If there's anything in the soil that they want to eat but they can't break down themselves, a lot of times bacteria or fungi will help them with that. Uh, they'll also help to store the water for the plant if the plant ever gets too thirsty. They provide nitrogen, and they can also fight diseases. So if your plant has a lot of good microbes or good bacteria on it, it'll help. So how many bacteria do you think grow on the roots and the leaves? Do you think that there's a lot or not very many? A lot. You think there's a lot? I don't think there's not very, very many if the plant is healthy. Okay, if the plant's healthy, that's a good idea, because it doesn't want too many, right? <laughs> so what if I told you that this bag of soil had about 100 billion bacteria in it, because this is about 10 grams. And every gram of soil and roots, you get about 10 billion bacteria. Whoa. And there's a little bit less in leaves, but not by that much. So this leaf is pretty large, but if I pull off a little chunk that's about one centimeter squared, there should be around 10 million bacteria on this. So that's pretty crazy. And these are all really healthy. So a while ago, we used to think that bacteria were always really bad and that um, they would steal nutrients and things. Yes, yeah, they would. and some of them do. So it's a really it's a balance. It's about the fact that the bacteria, some bacteria want the plant to live because they might get something out of the plant. Maybe the plant uh, protects them or provides nutrients to them. So it's it's a balance that they all want to live together happily. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the stem. But we're, first, we're going to talk about water and nutrient transport. And as we already found out, the water is going to be really important to help the plant make food uh, do, during photosynthesis. So the water and the minerals that the roots take up have to get up to the leaves. And so they travel through the stem to do that. So the stem kind of acts like a really big straw for the plant. So have you guys ever opened up a stem? And, or have you ever broken plants off? Uh -huh. Yeah. They're really wet, exactly, and that's because they're transporting water. And although they're really tiny, um, they have a lot of layers in them. So this is a stem from, um, from a little baby tree that was growing, and uh, our gardeners didn't want it to be growing anymore, so they pulled it out, but we saved it. Um, and so if you break this open, what you'll see are these different layers of tissues. 
So just like with people where we have different tissues that do different things, you know, our skin does different things than our stomach does and our eyes do different things, plants have different tissues that do different things. And this would be if you cut open the stem or the, the trunk of a tree. And a lot of times we don't think of the trunk of a tree being a stem, but it really is. Every single year the tree grows a little bit wider and that helps us to count. Uh, because it can only grow, most plants only grow during the summer. That's when they like to grow the best because they can get the most energy from the sun and they're not frozen. So you can count how many summers the plant has been through. So you have all these different layers, um, but it's important to notice that there's the phloem, and the phloem, you can think of phloem as food. So the phloem will help all the nutrients from the leaves get down to the roots. And the xylem, which I guess is not shown, but um, these other layers will help the water from the roots get up to the leaves. And so these are different types of stems. So we, got, we brought up earlier that potatoes are a type of root, and that's actually incorrect. We usually think of them as roots because they're below the ground, but it's kind of a fun fact that potatoes are actually a type of stem, and it's a storage stem. I know, I think that's really crazy because they absolutely look like roots, and they're always covered in dirt when you get them from the store. Um, but other things like strawberries, their, their stem wiggles around the ground, rhizomes, um, even some kinds of bulbs, or the if you've seen vines that twine up, that's a stem. And what do you guys think? This is a celery stalk. Do you think there's a stem, or a root, or a leaf? Stem. Stem. Celery. <laughs> celery, exactly. <laughs> that's a really good guess, and that's kind of what we thought too. We were like, yay, we have two different kinds of stems, but luckily we looked it up beforehand, and this is actually part of a leaf. So the thing with plants is that if you for a long time, um, we, we call plants what we think of them as for food. We always think of plants as food and cooking, and so we'll just ca call that a stalk. You know, it's a stem because it looks like a stem. But it's important that because all of these different plant parts have different functions, we know what functions they actually are, like what type of plant part they are. All right. So leaves. Leaves are the part that we really think about a lot. What's interesting though is that leaves are a lot more complex than you might think. So I'm going to pull off a leaf here. And you guys can see, it's like, it's paper thin, right? And if you rip it in half, it just looks like paper. So they're really flat, but what's interesting is if you look at it with your eyes, it just looks like a flat piece of paper, something green that you ripped apart. But if we had a microscope here, we could look at it and see a bunch of different layers of the plant. And first of all, on the top, this is called a cuticle is waxy, but just like on your, on your fingers, it kind of protects everything that happens, right? So the cuticle is waxy, it protects the plant leaf from insects, from drying out, from bugs. Um, and then underneath that is the really important cells of the plant. And these are the ones that are gonna do photosynthesis, and we're gonna talk about that. But like we just talked about, um, these cells, when they do photosynthesis, are gonna make the plant food. They also have, like we have, they have veins that help the water and the gases exchange. And then they have these little stoma at the bottom that let in carbon dioxide and out oxygen. So do you guys know why leaves change color in the fall? It's starting to become winter. And so it realizes, oh, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be using all of our energy. It's basically like the big plant taking a nap. Because just like with you guys, if you stayed up all night, you could stay up, but you'd really be tired the next morning. And there's not much for you to do in the middle of the night, right? So this is a way for the plants to conserve their energy. But what's interesting is that all of these different colors are actually already in the plant. So if you look out there, they all look green. And you might see a little bit of red, a little bit of yellow. Um, but that's because the chlorophyll, the main pigment in the plant, is green. And that's what kind of covers up all the other colors. But like we said, when the plant knows that it's going to be winter, or if it's running out of food, if it, if it realizes it's time to go to bed, it's time to sleep for the winter, then it stops making chlorophyll. And suddenly you can see all of these other colors. So the red is called anthocyanin, the orange is called carotene for carrots, and the yellow is called xanthophyll. <laughs> so photosynthesis, or how plants make sugar to eat. And this picture is kind of silly, right? Because plants can't walk around. That would be, that'd be crazy if this plant, if that tree out there just got really hungry and decided it wanted to go to McDonald's or something. <laughs> so, if they, can't make, if they can't get their own food, how are they going to have food to eat? Yeah. They make their own food. Excellent. So this is a really simplified version, but it, I think it covers everything that you need to know about it. So the energy from the sun is going to help the plant make its own food. And just like if you lay out on a hot day or if you lay out in the sun, even if it's not hot out, you start getting warm. And that's because the energy from the light of the sun is warming you. 
So the energy from the sun comes down, and the plant is going to take up carbon dioxide. Do you guys know what carbon dioxide is? Have you heard about this before? Yes, it's yeah. the air that we breathe out. Exactly. So we have a really good relationship with plants where we breathe out carbon dioxide, and they breathe out oxygen, and we kind of trade back and forth. So with the help of the water from the soil, the carbon dioxide from the air, and the energy from the sun, the plants can start making their own food. And then in turn, they release that oxygen. But here's an example of a plant that Exactly. So plants make their own food. And what's interesting about this is that um, for a while people thought that the Venus flytrap was eating bugs because it wanted food, it wanted sugars and things like that. But now they think it wants trace minerals or things that they can't get from the soil. So maybe this plant lives in soil where it doesn't get that phosphite or nitrogen and so it's going to eat the bugs. So there's, as you can see, there's a bee crawling on the inside here and he's very carefully, but then he touches something in the plant and the plant is very sensitive. And as soon as it feels that fly there or that bee, it'll close up. And these look sharp. They're not really that sharp, but it kind of forms a cage. And then the bee can't get back out. And then it will, the plant will secrete enzymes, eat the bee. So the pitcher plant's a little bit different because it basically sets a trap, right? So it's a big bowl of water that the, plant, that the bee smells or the bug smells. And it says, ooh, that smells really good. And so the fly will go into the opening, and then it'll get stuck in all the liquid. And then it can eat it. So flowers are pretty and they're important. Do you guys know why flowers are important? Yeah. They help pollinate other plants. Perfect. That's fantastic. OK, do you guys, have you seen the pollen around? Do you see all of that crazy yellow everywhere? That was insane. My car was just covered in yellow. And then it rained, and then all the yellow came back again. So plants are kind of special because they can actually make more plants by themselves. They have all the parts that they need to make more plants. But like we just talked about, the main important thing is that they have to make pollen to fertilize other plants. And that's where bees come in. So bees also have a very good relationship with plants. So a lot of different, uh, different plants like to attract different bugs or bees or insects. That way, they can only have pollination or cross-pollination between their same plants. So let's say a purple flower really attracted bees. Then the bee would go to that purple flower and would go to a purple flower a field away, and you'd get cross-pollination. And that's really good for the plants. And maybe like milkweed. Butterflies really like meat, milkweed. And so butterflies will go from flower to flower. And it's just a way for the plants to make sure and that they all get pollinated. The part that bees get out of it, the reason bees do this, is that they get to drink the nectar. And then plants help the, or bees help the plant reproduce by going from flower to flower. And do you know how the pollen gets from flower to flower on the bee? You might not be able to see it, but this is actually like pollen. Yeah, so on its feet and on its side, it's really bristly and furry. And so when it flies from spot to spot, yeah, you can see it better over there. You can see that big yellow clump. So when it flies from flower to flower, it'll get brushed with some pollen, and it'll put some more pollen back on the flower. And so flowers are really important because once the plant is pollinated, it can make fruit. What's actually really interesting, and we'll, we'll watch a video about it, is that flowers actually turn into the fruit. So fruits, they can store the seeds, and then they help the seeds get away from the plant because it wouldn't be really helpful, right, if um, a plant made a bunch of seeds and then all of the seeds fell around it because then those plants would try to grow up around it and they'd be competing for the water and the food. But if the seeds are in the fruit, and let's say an animal comes over and eats the fruit, and then he goes away and leaves the seeds elsewhere, or leaves the seeds far away, then it can grow up far away and they don't have to compete with each other. And then also in some cases, the fruit will actually provide food to the seeds. And so like we talked about, um, the flowers will actually turn into the fruit. And so this is, a, again, a really fast forwarded version um, of a plum, or not plum, I'm sorry, a pear. So these are, these are pear flowers, and they're really pretty. This is time lapse, and so you can see the flowers start to emerge, and here's the different parts with the pollen. Um, and so these little areas, once the bee comes in, will eat here, and then the pollen will get on it. But here, the flowers are starting to die. It's the end of the flower season. And you can see that one of these dead flowers is starting to grow and get bigger. And so over time, it's going to get bigger and bigger. And so it's important to remember that all of these leaves that are around it are making all of the sugar that goes into the, into the pear. So the pear will keep getting bigger, and the other flowers will die. I didn't know that this was how pears grew. Um, because if you get a pear from the store, you have, you know, it's usually the other way around. And I always wondered what this little 
part was. And so that's actually a dead flower. So once the seeds get out of the fruit and can grow a new plant, that's when the new life cycle begins.